Now, there's some people's theology that have a problem with Easter eggs, and uh, so just call them chicken eggs that the bunnies like, you know, do something like that, but it's like, you know, and anytime, anytime that the enemy ever does something to um, mess with us with regards to what God has already been doing in the earth, just remind him it was God's first. The devil doesn't create anything, and he has no right to anything. And so every time you think that the devil's really big, look at him like this. He's this little guy that's hanging on your ear. He's going, right? Can you, can you guys do that sound with me? It's the most annoying sound you've ever heard. Okay, don't do it. Please don't do it. But you just take, you know, the enemy's just messing with you. Just go, bank. He's done. It's Easter Sunday, and um, people, people ask us, you guys, hi, guys. <laughs> this is great spitting, like right here. This is like, the, this is the spitting for... I should have a chew in right now. Is actually what I should do, James? I, uh, but what was I saying? Bunnies, Easter's, bunnies. Guy in the ear. Oh yeah, thanks, Paul. So, so you got this guy. But you know, I want I want you to understand something. Jesus came to the earth, and he gave up all of his rights. All of his rights. He gave them all up to come here, and to do as a man what God could have done any time he wanted to, but he did as a man demonstrating who his father was. Can I just tell you something? Here's the deal. Can I tell you something? It's not, when we think about good against evil, it's not God against the devil. That's right. The devil is absolutely no competition for our God. That's right. no, 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 I mean, no, you guys gotta hear this. Listen, God could just go, a chew. And the devil goes, bink. So I want to tell you something. This may rattle you a little bit. But God didn't defeat the devil on that day because he didn't have to. His son took care of it. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. As, a, as one who fully gave up all of his rights to do, to demonstrate to us what one man completely yielded to his father under the influence of the Holy Spirit, could demonstrate in the earth of beating the devil at everything the devil tried. So guess what? We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This is why we celebrate Easter every single day of the year here at Glad Tidings. This is why. Because the devil is not competition to the God who lives with inside of us. And if we will yield and love and adore and represent God well on the earth, the enemy is no problem to us because he's no problem to the one who lives inside of us. The, the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. See, because I, I, I always used to think, you know, God and the devil, and ah, the devil's really loud, and God's really like soft-spoken, and then I figured out that God sneezed the stars into existence. <laughs> hey, did I say Happy Easter? I talked about the bunnies, right? Yep. Christmas? Every day, okay, so every day, like this is one thing around, you know, Pastor Scott, you're gonna do anything special for Easter? No, because every day we live a resurrected life. This is just one of those days in, in all of the days of our lives. This is one of the days that we just celebrate continually the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's just another day. But here's the beautiful. We celebrate Christmas on Easter too. And we celebrate Christmas every day of the year because the Easter bunny has this thing figured out. That God, it is the glory of God to hide things, Proverbs says. Or is it Psalms? It's somewhere in the Bible. Read it. Read it. It's really good. <laughs> You'll like it. God, God says, I, I, he, he hides things. It's his glory to hide things, and it's the glory of kings to do what? To discover them. God is not hiding things from you, y'all. God is hiding things for you. He is waiting for you to discover things about him that you didn't even know he had planned for you. And if we could just get this, then life does not become drab or religious anymore because God wasn't about religion and Jesus wasn't about it either. In fact, he came to say, listen, I don't want you to have a robotic relationship with me. I want you to have a relationship relationship with me. And we've made, we've made Christianity this thing, now do this, now do that, now do this, now do that, now do this. And he's saying, no, let's not have it be a linear thing. Let's have it be an exponential thing. Let's have it be an explosive thing. Let's have it be an encounter where every day is filled with surprises and gifts that you get to unwrap and discover more of who the Father is. Okay, the rest of you can just be bored. I, I had, I've done the religious thing, all right? I've done the religious thing. I like the relationship thing where I actually don't just know about God, but I know God. Yeah. And what's really fun is when he gets to know you and I, 
and we understand that he knows you and I. Some of us get a little bit afraid of, he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, and that can be a little scary sometimes. But he's with us always. But isn't that exciting that you get to actually do life with the one who created you, that you actually get to do life with the one who knows best. How, how many of you, if you were investing money, would like to hang out with the smartest guy who knows how to invest money? If you're building a house, how many would like to hang out with the guy who knows how to build a house, Paul Russo? You see what I'm saying? You're like, you wanna, well, well, God is so stupidly great, if I can say that. I might not be able to say that. There's nothing, there's, it's, he's like ridiculous. I probably shouldn't say that either. Um, he is sick. No, probably shouldn't use that one either. Whatever word you want to use to describe him that has, because see, the thing is, words can't define him because he's too big for it. So whatever moves you is way, way beneath who he really is. That's how amazing his grace is. That's who we serve. So happy Easter. I said all that, say happy Easter. And see what polite people do is they say happy Easter back when you say happy Easter to them. There. Wow. That was a good religious moment right there. <laughs> so let's do this. Oh, before we do the really, you know, before this, this is, let's do the really important thing first. By the way, I love kids. So all the kids say amen. You can just talk all you want and gab all you want. Adults, we will slap you though. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. There were these two old guys playing golf. Dick, you're one of them. These two old guys were playing golf, Joe. My dad would have enjoyed that. Uh, these, two, these two old guys were playing golf. Did I say that already? Yeah, yeah okay. Let's move on then. Um, these two old guys were playing golf, and the one guy, one old guy said, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing so well anymore. And so he hit the ball, and he said to his buddy, did you see where it went? And his buddy goes, yeah, but I forgot where it was. <laughs> so see, getting old is... Ridiculous. But that took you a long time. It just finally got over there. I'm glad. So, you guys, there was these two old guys. Hey, listen. This is what's beautiful. This is what's beautiful in Christ. He came to give us life and give us abundantly. And a lot of us need to know that there is a whole lot of life available to us. The enemy wants to steal everything. He wants to kill everything in you. He wants to destroy everything in you. He wants to destroy every relationship. But here's what's beautiful about Resurrection Sunday is that everything that you ever need is now available because Jesus paid for it all. And now all we gotta do is tap into the resources that he has for us. So Father, I just pray that today that you would speak to our hearts deep, uh, have your way, do what you wanna do, unlock things in us, release us of things, of lies that have been there in the past, set us on a course, a trajectory that is, that is completely guided by the true north that you have for us. Let your Holy Spirit teach us and bring us into all things we pray here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right, I wanna talk today at least about, since y'all are here, I wanna talk to you about what we believe because you might wanna stay if you know what we believe, and you might not wanna stay if you know what we believe. But I figure at least you know what you, we, you believe, what we believe, so you can figure out whether you wanna stay or not. That makes sense? How many know when you go to McDonald's what you're gonna get? Okay, that's a, maybe that was a bad choice. Um, how many know when you go to Walmart you're gonna get cheap stuff? Right? You know you're gonna get a smiley face, all that kind of stuff, you know what you're gonna get. See, you see, I think that, that people will buy into things, that people will buy into things that they know what they can expect. And here's the beauty about this house, is that uh, what you can expect here is the unexpected. Because every time we make our plans, God has the final say. And we are all about, we're, I, I, I'm an engineer previous to being this crazy pastor stuff, but, but we make plans, but here's the beauty. Like we had a set set up this morning for worship. How many enjoyed worship this morning? All right, All right, how many pistols, okay. And, and, and a lot of what happened in that process was not planned. But the beauty about God being at the, see, God's not our co-pilot around here. God's, God's actually our pilot. Yeah. And we're just kind of cruising along with him type of deal. 
But, but what we do is we try to, hey, listen, Lord, what are you doing? And then we try to do it. That Jesus modeled it really well when he said, I only do what my father's doing, I only say what my father's saying. We try to model that around here. But we wanted to give you guys today and want to remind our own people, because tomorrow night we're having our annual business meeting, like why we exist. So I want to talk today about the four cornerstones of a belief system that, that I think everyone should have, but we specifically have completely sold out for these four things um, around here. The first thing is this. Um, our first cornerstone is this. God is good, yeah. period. Amen. Nothing else, nothing else matters in comparison to his goodness. In fact, even when God is bringing judgment, it's for our good. I, I, I heard Mike, Mike Bickle say this. He said that when, when God begins to judge people or things, it's because he wants to stop the things that are actually trying to destroy the people. Yeah. Anything, that, anything that's meant to destroy us, God wants to judge so it doesn't have the ability to destroy us. Did that, that's a good God. You know, who, did, who said it? Good God. Good God. What's that? Wow, wow, wow. What's his name? Come on. James Brown. Wow, good God. I mean, he is. He's a good God. I'm the whitest black person you will ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever meet. So our first cornerstone is all of God's judgments. They're aimed at whatever interferes with the love of God. His predominant purpose, the reason that Jesus came, a lot of people think that Jesus, the reason that Jesus came was to die. The reason that Jesus came was to shed his blood. The reason Jesus came was to, uh, you know, to, to, to just do all these nice things and miracles and all that kind of stuff. Jesus, here, here's the bottom line. Jesus said it over and over again while he was on the earth. He said, the main purpose that I came here for was to reveal the heart of my Father. See, because there's a whole world out there that are living with this orphan mindset because they've never known the love of a father. And so it's only by God's goodness that we're actually able to experience the love of the father. And what we've done is we've taken life's situations and circumstances and difficulties and challenges and letdowns and we've said, God, that's your fault. When the reality is God is good all of the time and there's never a time that he's not good. And only good things come from him. See, if you have that mindset, then the things in the earth, you actually put the blame on the one you should be putting the blame on, which is the enemy, which the Bible says has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And now, now the, the problem lies in us, in the fact that we think that God is in control of everything, when the reality is, is he has given us a free will, and so based upon our free will, we invite things in or keep things out of our lives based upon our free will. And God's not going to go against our free will. Sometimes I wish he would go against my will, but he won't go against my will. And Jesus actually said this, not my will be done, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you guys, we all have to make that decision every single day. Am I going to invite heaven into the the truth of my life, or am I going to allow earth circumstances to dictate from a place of facts or a place of lies where I believe those more than I do the truth? So a real big deal, a real big cornerstone is the fact that God is so good. So when the bad stuff comes, just keep, keep declaring, God, you're good. Why? Because I know that all things work together for good, that those that love God and are called according to his purposes. How many of you have prayed and not had a good result? I have. How many have continued in pray, continued to pray and still not had a good result? I have. You know what? It doesn't matter. God is still good. Do you know why? Because I know that on the other side of the tragedy, there's something good that God is going to accomplish. There's something that's going to work in me for not just my benefit, for, for everybody around me. See, God does think great things for me, great things through me, but he also allows things in his sovereignty, what he could stop in his power. He allows things in his will. He allows things in, in his understanding. He allows things based upon the fact that he knows what? That this thing is actually gonna work out for the good, not just for this generation, but for that generation and that generation. There are things that people pay huge prices for. I've paid prices that my kids will never have to pay the prices for. They're able to inherit something that I've bought. And so is it fair that I had to pay for it? I don't know about fair, but I know this. Jesus gave up all of his rights so he could come here and do what he did for us to demonstrate that when you give up your life, you actually find it. Isn't that good? I think I'm going to rap something today. I felt that spirit of rap. Did you see it? Did you see it going? Not at all. I'm actually country. I'm really not. God's good. Cornerstone number two is, for us around here, nothing's impossible. 
Nothing's impossible. Every time that an impossibility comes for us, we have to stand in the place that with God, all things are possible. That's an absolute truth that we stand on here. There's nothing impossible for him. See, because when you live in a place where nothing's impossible for God, and you understand that you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and that Jesus said, with him, Jesus said this, without you, I can do nothing, but with you, all things are possible. If I can shift into that same mindset, if I can posture myself in that same thinking, then all of a sudden I've released, I've unleashed in me everything that is possible because it's in God, not because it's doable within my strength, but because in my weakness, his strength is perfected in me, and I rest in that, not for the sake of taking a nap, but I rest in that for the sake of activating something around me that says, God, I trust you completely because I know that all things, all things, remember you're good. I remember you're good and there's nothing impossible for you. And when the impossible things don't happen, I go back to, to cornerstone number one, God's still good all the time. It's so, man, this, this thing, it actually works. See, we've made, we've made Christianity this, all right? I made Christian, now, okay, I get saved. I do this, I read my Bible. I do this, I do my devotion, I do my devotion. I don't do this, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't hang around with people that do. And we've made this, this thing about Christianity some some do's and don'ts, and it's not. It's about get to's. I get to know that God is good all the time and not just have a theology on it, but to experience it. It doesn't matter what happens in the earth. God's good all the time, and I know that because I've experienced his goodness in the darkest times of my life. What good is a theology? It's actually pretty boring, and it's pretty disgusting to have a theology that you never experience. I don't want to have a theology, I know God saves, bless God, God saves, but I never experienced salvation. I, I, I know God's good, but I never experienced his goodness. I know God is love, but I don't ever actually know his love. That's the lies of the enemy, he wants to keep you from something that God hasn't planned for you, so much planned for you. Pastor Scott, you're being emotional, I know. I was created this way. <laughs> Mwah. <laughs> Cornerstone number two. I really... Because, because we believe that all things are possible and that nothing is impossible, we actually in, invade, we love invading the impossible. Pastor Scott, I love when somebody tells you you can't do that. Pastor Scott, you can't do that. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. People think I'm rebellious. No, it's just I'm, I like doing impossible things. Do you know most things I've ever done for God are crazy? Do you know, G, think about this. Jesus was told by his father, you gotta die to save the world. That's crazy. Oh, Jesus, you're never gonna have a place to lay your head. That's crazy. Ready for this one? This is gonna, everybody say agree with this. Give 10% of your money to God. That's crazy. <laughs> Unless you've experienced yes. the life of what it produces. Jesus was able to go to the cross. You know why Jesus was able to go to the cross? Because he knew the joy that laid on the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can get through anything if you know what's on the other side of it. No pain, no gain. I'm telling you, you're not gonna want the pain if you don't know what the gain is. But see, that's why we have to have eyes of understanding that he says, open my eyes so that I might see who is with me instead of those that are against me. Are you tracking? This is how good God is. This is what God wants for your life. This is the potential that each one of us have when we actually engage and find out who he is and then find out who we are in him and then find out who he is in us. It is so amazing when you actually discover all that you have and all that you are and all the resources that, you, that are available to you. Do you know why most people don't write checks? Because they'll bounce. <laughs> no, because they don't know what's in the bank account. How many walk in so much fear in their lives because they don't know what actually is available to them? How many people worry about things? Man, if I had a million bucks in the bank, I wouldn't worry. Okay, let's just say that you have a million bucks in the bank, stop worrying. Because everything that you need was paid for. This is our cornerstone number three. Everything that you need ever in life, ever in eternity, has completely been paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why we celebrate Easter. Every debt, everything you'd ever owe has completely been paid for. For all of eternity, everything has been completely settled on that cross. That's why we can say God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. People struggle with that statement. What do you mean God's not mad at me? He is not mad at you. Do you know why I know that? Because all, the Bible says, all of his anger and all of his wrath was taken out on his son. Yeah. So if all of his anger and all of his wrath was taken out of his son, that means he's got none left for us. Yeah. All right. When he sees us, how does he see us? In Christ. 
Do you think he's mad at his son? Mm-mm. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta understand. Yeah, well, sometimes the way things happen, I feel like God's mad at me. That's because you're believing the lie of the enemy because God is good all the time. Remember cornerstone number one? Remember that, that, that in God, all things are possible? Well, remember that everything that you'll ever need is being completely paid for? See, a lot of people think you have to work for favor. A lot of people think you have to work for victory. Not true. You work from favor and you work from victory. It's already been won, it's already been done, it's already been settled, I work from that place. How many of you would like to go into a battle knowing that every battle that you face has already been won? There's a mindset, there's a place, well, yeah, okay, well, can I tell you something? To the world, it didn't look like Jesus won when he was on the cross, when he was being beaten, when he was being bruised, when he was being stabbed, when he was crowned with thorns going to his head, it didn't feel good. But there was something that he knew he was purchasing with the pain that he was going through so that we could enjoy a life that he died for. And so that's the same for us. There's things that I'm gonna pay for with things of my life. There's losses, there's, there's sufferings, there's sacrifices that I'm gonna pay for. Why? So that my children and their children and their children are gonna benefit from something if I stay in Christ, if I stay obedient, if I stay the course, if I hand the, the baton off, if I finish my race, that's what purchases it. Jesus' finished work is what accomplished it. Not because he was born, but because he died and he rose again because God finished something that the son was willing to start. And that's so he's the author, he's the finisher of our faith. This is an Easter message yeah. <laughs> on steroids. Cornerstone number four is this. And some of you might be struggling with this, but let me tell you I pray for the day that you don't, and that's this you are significant. You are significant, everything about you is significant. Everything that you'll ever do is from your significance. It's from your identity. <laughs> Here's the warning. As you're finding your significance, don't be your significance that you build your kingdom around. Lucifer, in his significance, failed miserably. Do you know where your a person who understands their identity understands the significance of the one who gave them their identity. Yeah. And when you stand in awe of his significance, you'll never have a problem being owned by your significance. And when you understand that you are in Christ, you understand that Christ in you, you in Christ, is what gives you your significance, you're never gonna have a problem with pride. You will always stay humble to a king that was willing to pay it all so that you could actually be significant in a world that said you were nothing. So those are four cornerstones. But having a belief system isn't enough. Your belief system has to produce something in you called behaviors. Your theology actually has to have an action. Some people think you can rest in Christ so you can take a nap, when reality is resting in Christ actually activates you into something that you couldn't do without resting in Christ. But resting in Christ never stops you, it explodes you into your next purpose destiny. <laughs> uh, Garlington, Joseph Garlington said this. You know, we go from glory to glory to glory to glory. And, uh, and Joseph Garlington said, you know, between the rooms of glory to glory, it's the hallway. It's called the hallway of hell. And sometimes what happens is we get stuck in the hallway before we get to the next glory. Sometimes we're like, man, I'm not willing to make it through the hallway to get the next glory. I allow the hallway to stop me from the room that God has prepared for me of a glory and a goodness. Sorry for spitting on you guys. I saw it go right on you. It didn't hit you two, which I'm glad because you both would beat me up, but they, I'm sorry. It's like, but you, you go from glory to glory, and, and, and so what the enemy does is he throws the, the, the glory to glory. That's the hallway. In that hallway of hell is where you allow, the, see, the, the, we, we, we read this all the time. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. But yet we allow the walking through the valley of shadow of death to create all kinds of fear in us. 
to create all kinds of doubt. But see, the reality is, if we knew that you are with me, if I know I'm holding your hand, see, it's the significance of you, Father, that I know that I'm a son, that I'm not an orphan, just trying to survive, just trying to get out vengeance, just rather to get even with people, to walk in my rights. See, that's what orphans do. But a son understands I'm significant because I'm holding my father's hand. So there's nothing that the world can bring against me. Why? Because I'm holding my father's hand. Yeah, but Pastor Scott, what about the loss here? What about the loss here? What about the loss or, or gain does not matter in this world to, uh, to create a significance. Identity comes from who is your father. Yeah, it's not what you have or what you don't have. Most people would say Jesus was a failure. He didn't have a place to lay his head. But I'm gonna tell you right now, Jesus was the greatest world changer that ever happened in the earth and he's still changing the world, the world today from 33 years of what the world would call insignificance. God said he was very significant. Yeah. So don't allow the world to determine your significance. Let your identity in the Father actually determine your significance as a son. Stop the orphan thinking and walk into a sonship where you know that everything that he has is available to me. And because everything he has is available to me, then I can actually give it away. See, people who know who they are always give away what they have. A son, like Levi's a classic example. Oh, Lord Jesus, this boy. I love him so much. Are you in here? He's out, he's out in fire starters. He's lucky or I'm lucky, I don't know which, he's 200 pounds, there's no way, I'm not, he's, I'm lucky. All right, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal, Levi, we got him a $100 pair of shoes, a pair of boots. He's gonna be going hiking with Jeremy and a whole bunch of guys at the end of June. Levi decides that he's gonna trade his boots for an iPod. Yeah, he did. Yep, sure did. Levi is not at all worried. He doesn't have an orphan mindset in his body because he knows, guess what? Hey, guess what? Dad will get me another pair. Now, I'm not telling you to trade in your boots because God's gonna get you another pair. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is this, that everything that you have need of, everything, listen, Levi is not worried about what he's gonna eat today. I promise you. I promise you. He's not even, all he's gonna say, he'll, he might say, when are we gonna eat, Dad? But he's not gonna say, what are we gonna, are, are, he's not gonna ask, are we gonna eat? See, see, Levi's not dreaming about what he's gonna eat. He's not dreaming about getting vengeance on people because he's a son. What he's dreaming about is, what am I gonna do? What kind of a Superman am I? Am, am I Batman? Am I Superman? Am I Robin? Or am I Wonder Woman? No, not Wonder Woman. <laughs> Man, but you know, listen, listen. If you stop dreaming, you're dying. If you don't stay in a place of vision and of hope and you're not dreaming about the future, you're not dreaming, if you're allowing the world to just choke you out and the cares of this life to just choke you out, then you're dying spiritually, you're dying relationally, you're dying physically, you're dying emotionally, you're dying, you're dying financially if you don't stay in a place of what is it next, God? And I trust you with my money, I trust you with my kids, I trust you with my wife, I trust you with my relationships, I trust you with my life, I trust you with my boss, that's a tough one, but I trust you with my boss, even if she is my wife. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, didn't Jeremy rock on the drums this morning? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, when I tell people to start worshiping God, a lot of you will put your hands up. Some of you might go like this. When I tell people to worship God, you know what Jeremy does? He runs to the drums and starts beating on them. Yeah. It's just true. <laughs> That's another one of our cornerstones. We won't talk about that today. Identity is a big deal. My significance is a big deal. Here's the behaviors. Cornerstone number one, God is good. Since God is good, and I just touched on this, you are required, listen to me, church, you're required to dream big. It's not an option. If you're gonna be one of his sons, you're gonna be a dreamer. Why? Because the creative nature of God demands it. There's things that you have, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, words have not spoken. Your thoughts aren't big enough to contain everything that God has for you. And if culture could start getting this, we would stop living a life of religion limitation and we'd start living a life of relationship that says, I can do anything because everything's possible. I can dream again. He takes the garbage can lid off of your head and you begin to dream and become creative and know that if this door shuts, this one's opening. Because all things work together for good that those who are called love God are called according to his purposes. Remember, go back to cornerstone number one, God is good. If God's good, then you ought to be able to dream. Hello, Lucy. How many would sooner have a traditional message today? Ah, okay, good. Those of you who do, you should come to the Easter service 10 years ago. 
<laughs> okay. See, it's not that doing things out of tradition is bad, it's just that it is. He said, he said it, Jesus said it. It's because of the traditions of men that you do this crazy, stupid stuff. You're more interested in pleasing men than you are pleasing God. God has never done anything the same way twice. Yet he's the same yesterday and today and forever. It's the craziest tension. Why, because he's a creative God. Oh, by the way, your salvation is not like my salvation. You have a unique personal salvation experience with the Lord. Your relationship with him is unique. You, you, how, whatever that looks like for you, it doesn't look the same way for me. But yet we've made it do this, make this, stand up, do this, right, right, right up here. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're driving me nuts with all the do's and the don'ts. I'm just telling you, when you love somebody and you're in love with somebody, you don't have to have somebody tell you what to do and what don't. You will want to do what you're supposed to do and not, and not do what you're not supposed to do. Why, because you're in love. When you're in love, you do things you didn't even know you could do. I stayed up all night talking to this woman and then worked all day and Brendan had to keep me awake at work because I was in love with this woman. And he's still my friend. That's a sign, wonder, and a miracle. Dream big. Get the heart of the Father. <laughs> Second thing is, if nothing is impossible, take risks. Stop walking in fear. Do you know more people, listen, listen, this ties in with the dreamers. People who dream big actually do much. People who don't dream don't do anything. They're too afraid to do anything. They're too afraid to dream. They're afraid to step out. They're afraid to take risks. See, but the thing is, if you know that nothing is impossible and that God's good all the time, what are you afraid of taking risks for? The Bible says that it's impossible to please God without taking risks. Well, I'll, let me put it another way. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. If you have to have everything that you under, if everything that you ever do is based upon your understanding, then it's not faith. It's a walk by sight, not by faith. See, if everything has to be laid out for you, and oh, if I just know what, I need to know the next five-year plan, I need to know the next 10-year plan. No, 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 you get the next step. The steps of a righteous man, not the miles, not the years of a righteous man. He said this, if, listen, you let me take care of the steps, I'll get to, I'll get to take care of the years. That's all you got to do. Does that make sense? So you trust him, you take risks. Man, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know about stepping into this new business adventure, right, Adam, right, Leslie, right? How many, I mean, how many, right? It's like, I got him on this, both sides of me. But listen, there's people out here, listen. Every great invention started with a risk. Every great invention started with a dream. We got to the moon because somebody was crazy enough to tell somebody else about the dream they had. Are you crazy? Yes, I'm crazy. Why? Because I trust God. Am I yelling at you? I'm just coaching you. Like, what? That's a cheerleader. That's not a coach. My pom-poms. I was asking this question. See, I've had a lot of theology and I've, had, I've preached a lot of sermons that I've heard other people preach about people getting healed. I've begged for mercy and watch young ones slip out of my hands. But I made a decision I made a decision that I'm not just gonna have a theology that God is good, and I'm not just gonna have a theology that God wants to see people saved, and I'm not just gonna have a theology that God wants to see people healed. I'm actually gonna take a risk and actually step out and say, God, I'm gonna keep pushing on this boulder till this boulder makes it up over the hill, and I get the revelation, and I walk in the same thing that your son walked in, because I'm gonna represent you well on the earth, and I'm not settling for my bad experiences to determine who you are. I'm not staying there. I'm gonna press on, and I'm gonna fight again, and I'm gonna fight again, and I'm gonna fight again, and I'm gonna fight again because somewhere, someday, you're gonna be exalted in a manifestation of who you actually are because there's been enough doubt and enough fear to limit who you are. I wanna release everything that you are into the atmosphere that I live. And I'm not stopping till, till every breath is squeezed out of me. I'm not stopping, why? Because I know that you're good. Because I know that you're kind. Because I know that you're for me. Because I know that nothing, no weapon formed against me can prosper. I know that. I can't have a theology that contradicts that because I've had bad experiences. And I'm sorry. There's been great loss in this room. There's been great loss in families. There's been great loss. 
My heart aches, but can I tell you something? Because God is good, I know his heart aches. And he saw it, and he, he was willing to come and give up his life so we could have a potential in this earth to experience something that was only available in heaven. He cried out before he died on this earth. He cried out, Father, not my will, but your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. You know why? Because I know what it's like there, and they need to know what it's like here. And I can't stop allowing heaven to invade earth when earth needs heaven. Because everything that's destroying the earth is from hell, and everything that will bring life to the earth is in heaven. That's why I love Easter, and the Monday after Easter, and the Tuesday after Easter, and the Wednesday after Easter, because every day belongs to my God. So I found that in my life, I don't want to have just a good theology. I want to have good fruit. But I found that I have to dig, I have to plant, I have to water, I have to trim, I have to groom, I have to, there's a lot of things that I have to do to actually get fruit to come. And sometimes fruit doesn't come in the first season. Sometimes it takes a few seasons of working really hard to see the fruit come. Sometimes it takes years for that tree to produce something it was meant to produce out of seed form. But I'm gonna not let that seed die because I planted it in good ground and I'm gonna keep watering that seed. I'm gonna keep pouring water on that and I'm gonna keep nurturing that. I'm gonna keep praying it until I see that tree produce fruit so that my kids can see that it's whatever this is, I love it because why? I see the fruit of it. I don't just have a theology about it. I can't. I can't. Wow. Sorry I'm so emotional. I got up early this morning and I did not eat breakfast. <laughs> number three, my cornerstone number three said everything that I'll ever need was purchased at the cross. So my behavior is this, is that God, you purchased it all. Here's the reality. Now I'm gonna trust you. You purchase it all. I believe you purchase. Is there anything? Is there anything that I lack? The Bible says, "You ask anything in my name. Ask anything in my name. Ask anything in my name, and it will be done." How many have asked some things in His name and haven't been done? I have. Right. That doesn't change the truth. What it says is to them that believe. See, what it is, I can't just say I have a belief, and I can't just, see, I gotta walk in my belief. See, nothing changes whether I get it or whether I don't. I still have a belief. Why? Because God is good, he's trustworthy, and he cannot lie. These are cornerstones I've built my life on, a cornerstone that, I, that, I, that holds everything together, a cornerstone that, that defines the lines for me. I've built and I'm not moving off of that. Why? Because it's a cornerstone is what actually holds the whole building. What good is the building if you don't have strong cornerstones? I'm not moving off of a, uh, I'm not gonna create a theology out of my bad experiences because of my lack of trust in God. God, I don't understand it, but it doesn't matter. I'm moving on in it because I know this is who you are. See, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I've had a lot of opinions in my life. And I've had a lot of people around me with opinions in their life. I'm gonna tell you, everybody has opinions. But I'm gonna tell you what in the kingdom is much, much stronger, and it is the only thing that you can live by. It's called conviction. And see, what I found is my convictions are things I'm willing to die for. It's not an opinion. See, nobody will die for an opinion. Nobody will give their life up for it. But a conviction you will die for, and you'll stand. Listen, I, 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 want, I also wanna tell you, move from the, don't, don't share your opinions. Share your convictions. Because a conviction is that you'll invest in the person you're sharing it with because it's a conviction. And I wanna tell you something, if this gospel message isn't true, spend your life. If you don't believe this gospel message is true, it's up to you to make sure that everybody knows that it's a fake. Otherwise, shut up. Or, if it's true, then it's up to us to make sure that everybody knows that it's true. If you don't really believe it, don't act like you do because you're giving it a bad name. Woo, hi, happy Easter. Whew. But do you understand what I'm saying? If I didn't believe this was true, then, I, then, then a man of conviction would make sure that you don't think it's true. But since I do believe it's true, I'm, I'm basing my whole life, my eternal life, my children's life, everything of my integrity on the fact that this is true. It's not a happening, it's not a religious thing, it's not a, it's not a theory, it's, not, it's a conviction. And you gotta live and breathe in your convictions, otherwise all you're doing is walking by feelings. Or opinions. Huh. Can I get another chew? <laughs> I love this guy. 
All right. Aren't you lucky I'm almost done? It's almost Burger King time. You're thirsty. Uh, by the way, I snot all over that. <laughs> My fourth behavioral uh, distinctive, if you would, is based upon this. That since I'm significant, I serve well. Jesus in John 13 <laughs> If we can just go there, we're gonna conclude on this uh, text, John 13. <clears throat> wow, I'm wrecked. Hey, if I offended anybody, um, I apologize, lest that offense turn something amazing into your life because the intention is for you to be the amazing person that you actually are. That's my intent. I have no other heart. I have no, I have no desire to hurt anybody. I have no desire. Um, maybe Scott used to, but the Scott who is who's Jesus, who's the one who everybody likes. <laughs> um, there's never ever an intention to demand or to make you feel bad about where you're at in your journey. It's always an invitation to come into more because once you taste the more, you won't wanna settle for the least. Yeah. John 13, two, it starts here. This is one of my favorite things, supper. <laughs> it says, and, su <laughs> and supper being ended, which that's a bummer, um, the devil having uh, already put it into the heart of Jesus or Judas Iscariot, wow, Simon's son to betray him, already with all that happening. Verse three, it says, Jesus, comma, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what, am I, what, what I am doing you do not understand right now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but wash my, my hands and my head. I love Peter because Peter was an all or nothing kind of guy. No, you're not gonna wash anything, and then yeah, I'll wash me all. But I wanted to emphasize verse three, Jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things. This is at the end of Jesus' life. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He's having the last supper with his disciples. And this revelation comes to him that his Father had given him all things. Now remember I said earlier, remember I said earlier that Jesus had given up everything to come to the earth. He gave up all of his rights, right? He gave up everything, his deity, you know, he, it's like, it's like he moved into this place where, you know, though he was fully God and he was fully man, and he moved into this place in the earth of, of, of where, where it's like, how should I say it? He came vulnerable. Am I, am I making sense? He came into a vulnerable place here on the earth. And he poured himself out. And so he's living here in this place where he gave all of, his, all of his rights. Now he's at the end of his assignment. He's 33 years old. He's at the end of his assignment and the Lord reveals to him that all things have been restored to him just before he dies. Now what happens is when Jesus steps into this place, he says this, he goes, I, I, I know that my father has given me all things. He's put it into my hands. And then he says this, that I had come from God and that I'm now going to God. See, what's beautiful about when you come into your identity, you know where you're from, you know where you're going, and you know what's available to you. Now, Jesus could have done a lot of stuff right here. He could have called 10,000 angels to deliver him. He could have got all proud and all boasted of himself. But what did Jesus do when he moved into a revelation of his identity on the earth? What did he do? He took a towel, he put it over over his arm and then he took a basin of water and he gets down and he washes his disciples' feet. See, people who know who they are always give it away. If you, listen, listen, if, if you don't ever have to tell somebody who you are because when you know who you are, you just give yourself away. 
you pour yourself out because you know what? There's an endless supply of everything that you are because you're found in Christ and Christ is in you. There's a resource of heaven. There's nothing that can defeat you. There's nothing that come against you. There's no words that can be spoken over you. There's no actions that can be taken against you. If you're absent from the body, you're present from the Lord. If, you, if you're alive, you're alive to Christ or, or, you're, or, or uh, you're dead to Christ, you're alive, whatever. Those, uh, you know, you're, it's all good. When you know who you are, it's all good. What are you going to do? You're going to kill me? Big deal. I'm with the Father. You have an attitude of complete trust, a complete surrender. You see, people that are trying to preserve their lives, they always lose it. People that lose their lives, they always find it. That's the way of the kingdom. And Jesus, when he comes into his, this full revelation, if you would, of his identity, of who he was and why he was here and where he was going, what his purpose, what his destiny was, when you get that locked down, all of a sudden what happens is, is you bow your knee and you say, man, not my will your will be done. See, people who know who they are never demand that their will be done. People who know who they are, they never demand that it's got to be my way or the highway. People who demand, they understand that heaven is this permissible environment, permission environment, if I could say, not permissible, like a permission, an invitation environment where he says, come on in, you're invited into a life that is amazing, but he never demands of us. He never tries to control us. He never tries to manipulate us. He just sits there and he says, listen, this is who I am. I invite you to be who I am because when you find out who I am, you're gonna have life more abundantly and then you're gonna give it away. So stop trying to hold on to something that you really have no ownership of anyways and start moving in something that you will so delight yourself in, you'll be amazed at the life that God has for you. You'll never be the same. Everything will change. And I like to say it begins with a few words, but I'm just gonna tell you right now, God did not come here to look for you to say a few words. God didn't send his son for you to say a few words to get saved, quote unquote. This is what he came for. He came to kill you. Why? Because he wants you to find you. So if you want this life, if you want to have a life that actually is life and not just living, like uh, not just sustaining, not just surviving, then when we open up the altars, you shouldn't even hesitate. You should run here. I mean, really. Are you kidding me? What a deal. You get him for you. You get life instead of death. You get freedom instead of bondage get faith instead of fear. I will never be afraid of another thing or another person again as long as I'm walking in faith because where there's faith, fear can't be. Love, perfect love casts out, displaces all fear. I way sooner to walk in love than walk in fear. And it's only doable in Him, but it is absolutely doable in Him. Stand with me. If you would. Don't, that's not a demand. You can sit there if you want. And if you feel comfortable, we're gonna worship one more time and this altar is gonna be open and uh, I'll stop spitting so there won't be anybody getting spit on here. But our team is gonna be up here and they'd love to lead you, invite you, teach you, love on you, pray for you, agree with you, but don't walk out of here still in bondage. Be free. And, and it'll be an easy day to remember because it's Easter that your birthday was Easter, where you actually came alive. I remember that day back in 2015 on Easter, I became alive. And you'll be able to tell your grandkids about it. It's a good day. It's the best day. If, and if you don't remember what that day, let's say you, 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 you did that a few years ago and you've forgotten what that feels like, come on back up and get reminded. It's a good day. Put your hands on your heart, would you? Father, I just ask that you just go deep into the heart of every single person here with the truth, Father, of Jesus that will set them free. Brand new, brand new day. Let there be a hope in a future that has a lot attached to it that we have no idea the plans and the purposes. But we're gonna move into that place where we know you're good. We know we can trust you. We know that the cross paid for it all. We know that we're significant. Why? Because you paid a huge price for us. That's because we're priceless. Huh. Thank you, God, that you would take the veil off of our eyes. So we'd see, we'd hear the way that was appropriate to represent you well in the earth. Let it happen today. Not a religious act, but an encounter, a beginning.
to a, to, a, to, a, to a life that absolutely has no end. That's what I pray for every single one of my friends here today. In Jesus' name, happy Easter. Let's worship one more time. Altars will be open, then you're dismissed. And there's all kinds of food out there. If you don't have any food, go get some, all right? In Jesus' name, let's worship, Sean, please.